to the gathering of the First China Church of Christ in Hawaii. If you are visiting for the first time, please fill out our visitor's card that you will find in the key and place it in the cool bowl in the foyer on our welcome table. You can also place it in the offering bag. This morning, we also want to recognize our first-time visitors. Please stand if this is your first time. We have several announcements for you this morning. Mahalo for the altar flowers from Vi and Manny Barreto and Sharon Chun. The church is planning a campus cleanup on Saturdays, October 28th and November 4th from 9 to 11 a.m. Please come and bring cleaning supplies such as brooms and gloves. Please see Philip Hong if you have any questions. His phone number is in the bulletin. The Grief Support Group's next meeting will be October 24th at 10 a.m. in the conference room. We meet every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. All are welcome. If, if you have any questions, please speak to Diana or Chuck Petronic. October 29th is Mission Sunday. Randy and Cheryl Lee, who are affiliated with Global Services Associates, will share during the missions moment. Missionary guest speaker, Reverend Chuck Lind, will preach during the English worship service. The 77th Annual Missions Food and Craft Fair of 2023 will also occur. If you are willing to make or bake foods to sell at the fair, we ask that you please sign up on the Eva Lanai. Benefit luncheon tickets can also be purchased. On Sunday, November 5th, 2023, at our 10.30 a.m. worship service, we will hold Remembering Our Saints Sunday. If you'd like to light a candle for someone who passed away from November 2022 and November 2023, please notify the church by today, October 22nd. We will also offer a baptism class in November. Please speak to Pastor John if you are interested. Let's continue in worship through song. If you are able, we invite you to stand and sing. Please join us we sing as we gather in steadfast love.
I hope that you are blessed that you have come to worship today. And let's uh, sing Father of Lights. I pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, burdened by the weight of this world's sufferings, as we witness the seemingly unending strife, we are often left bewildered by the news reports and the stories that flood our lives. Another war, another tragedy, another calamity, it leaves us wondering how can such things be? But we know that your word your holy word, has warned us that in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars. Nations will rise against nations. There will be famines and earthquakes. Yet even as we see and hear about these things, you've told us not to fear. Grant us the strength to obey your call. Instead of fear, calls us to pray and calls us to continue to share the gospel of your redeeming love. For we know that you will return and we know that your promises are true. We recognize that you are the sovereign ruler of this entire world, even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of suffering. In this dark and troubled world, empower us to be beacons of your light, to manifest your love to those who are in anguish and in fear. Lord, our hearts ache for the people of Ukraine. 
where conflict and war have brought unimaginable pain and suffering. We ask for the gift of peace to descend upon that land. May families torn apart from conflict find comfort in you. May your healing touch mend wounds. Grant wisdom to leaders seeking reconciliation and embolden nations to support endeavors for lasting peace. In the ongoing strife between Israel and the Palestinians, we yearn for a resolution, one that will bring an end to the cycle of violence and suffering for both groups of people. We ask you to grant understanding, compassion, and a path towards a just and enduring peace. May your grace and mercy guide the hearts and minds of those involved in seeking a solution. The recent earthquake in Afghanistan has not only shaken the earth, but also the lives of its people. Be with those affected by this disaster, whether through loss or injury or displacement. Give strength and resilience to the Afghan people as they face yet another hardship. May your comforting presence be with them, and may the world extend its hand in support and aid to help them build and recover. Lord, we know that your gospel of grace it is for all people, all people of every nation. It is a reality that there are many who don't know you and may not have ever heard your name in these places. In the midst of these conflicts and all the others in the world, give the church, your church, strength to share your name to, so that all people will come to a saving faith in Jesus. It is only through him that we can have real, actual, lasting peace. And Lord, we remember we remember that one day your son will return to set all things right. He will bring justice. He will bring peace. Lord, we long for that day. Come quickly, Lord. It is in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, that we pray all of these things. Amen. Let us say the Lord's Prayer together now. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand, if you are able, as we continue to worship the Lord in song.
may be seated. We will now worship our Lord through our tithes and offerings. Ushers, I invite you to come forward as we sing together. It is time. In his time, in his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his time, Lord, please show. Heavenly Father, you are the giver of all good things. We now give our tithes and offerings back to you. Please use these gifts for your kingdom and for your glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus today. Amen. Good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. That's Galatians Chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Uh, let me read our passage, and then I will pray for us as we open our time in God's holy and perfect word. Verse 10. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you to, to speak to us through your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Guide us now and apply your word to our hearts. In the name of Jesus, your Son, we pray. Amen. So here in Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, we see that there are two paths. 
They're not walking paths or bike paths or trails that lead up into the mountains. No, these paths are paths that we might take in order to be safe from our sin and from judgment. And you are on one of these two paths. One is the way of blessing. The other is described as a curse. One path gets to God by trusting in him and his gospel of grace. The other is by keeping a righteous standard without any error. I wonder, which path are you on? Really, which one best describes your life? Let's look at verse 10. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. So before we break down this verse, I want to remind you about what's going on. Paul has moved into this new section of his letter. He's defending the gospel of grace. The idea that we are justified, made right with God by simple faith. And he's defending this idea by looking at scriptural evidence in order to show his reader that this idea is nothing new. He didn't invent it. He's not some rogue operative, you know, trying to push some brand new religion. No, this is the way that it's always been. That's what he's trying to show. If you notice, as I read, over and over during these verses, it's, for it is written, for it is written, and then you see the quotation marks, right? Paul is quoting from the Old Testament. He's trying to prove that his idea was always there from the very beginning. So let's keep that in mind. Now, let's jump into verse 10. Here, Paul lays out a path. A path that one might hope will result in salvation. A path that a person might hope will make them right with God. He says at the beginning of this verse, all who rely on observing the law. In other words, all who hope that they can be saved by law following, or by their efforts, or by their good works, or by their good deeds. There are people who hope that they can be saved this way, right? You know them, you've met them, you might be one of them right now. That's one of the paths. And as I said already, that might be you today. It might not be. This might not be what you're hoping will save you. But at some point, this was you. Before coming to Christ, according to Romans 6.14 and a bunch of other places, you were under the law. This was your hope for salvation. This was your path. And if you don't know Jesus today, this is your path right now. This is the path that you are on. The only hope that you have for being made right with God, if you are not believing in Jesus, is by law following. You may be the biggest pagan in the room. You may love to go party, drink, whatever. Or you may be the most religious person in the room. But if you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, then this is your path. Now, religious people... They don't mind this so much. Religious people are often legalists. We've mentioned this word before. Legalists believe that salvation can be earned through obedience. Legalism is the view that we can earn God's favor by what we do. A religious person or a, a legalist might think, well, I, I go to church. I tithe. I'm kind to my neighbor. I give money to good causes. I treat people well. God is going to accept me. I've done his will. I've done what he wants. I've done it my whole life. He must accept me. He, he, I, I earned it. When I get to heaven, he's going to let me in. That's often what religious people think. And, and there's a lot wrong with that, right? There's a lot wrong with that mindset. For one, it's just not true. You can't earn your way into heaven. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For it is by grace that you are saved. Through faith, this is not of yourself. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Paul clearly says it right here in Ephesians. And he's going to say it really clearly in our passage this morning too. 
You cannot be saved this way. It's not possible. Second, this mindset can lead to pride and self-righteousness. Both are sins, right? And ultimately, this way of thinking leads to frustration and despair because you're never going to live up to the standards, to these standards. I mean, consider why you might despair. Look at what Paul says next. All who rely on the law, on observing the law, are under a curse. Why are they under a curse? Well, Paul keeps writing. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Paul here is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. This is the part of the law that talks about the blessings and the curses. And Paul is quoting a summary of that section in Deuteronomy. You are under a curse according to scripture if you do not perfectly obey the law. You're cursed. It's not any more clearer than that. You see, God has a law, and if all things in that law are abided by at all times, then you would be righteous. But by breaking just one law, like Adam and Eve, we become guilty, and we're put under a curse. James makes the same point. James 2.10 says, Whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become guilty of all of it. Now, my wife and I, we've been around this island uh, a bunch of times at this point. Uh, we've visited the North Shore, we've visited the other shore, and we've been all around. One place that we haven't visited is the docks. I don't suspect that we will visit the docks. You, I, I just don't see that happening. But I, I want all of us this morning to imagine that we are there. We're all at the docks. Imagine that you're, you're watching a... a, a a cargo container being removed from a Matson ship. Imagine that this cargo container is dangling from, from a large chain attached to a crane, and it's being lifted off of one of those ships. What will happen if one ring on that chain fails? What will happen? If one of those rings on that chain fails, the container is going to plummet, right? Right back into the water. Every inch of that chain must hold its own, or that chain is no good, right? That's what scripture is saying. This is how it is with God's law. If even one part of God's law is broken at one point, perfection is lost. We need to understand this. To be honest, I think the world needs to understand this. God's standard is not that you be a good person. His standard is not that you be just good enough and I'm going to let you into heaven, into my presence. No, God's, God, God requires you to be perfect. You have to be perfect in order to get into heaven. Not just good enough, not just kind of good, not just good, but perfect. And guess what? You've broken the chain. You've broken that chain at least once. But most likely, you've broken it over and over and over and over again. Romans 3.23 tells us, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Scripture declares this. And let's be honest, you know this to be true. You're a sinner. You probably sinned today. You definitely did yesterday. You're a sinner through and through. So do you hope to be saved through your efforts? Through your work? If that's your hope, then you should expect to be frustrated. As I said earlier, because you're never going to be perfect and you're going to fail. And if this is your hope, then you should despair because the word of God says that you are under a curse. If this is your way, then frustration and despair is all that you have. But, 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 but there is hope. Look at verse 11. Clearly no one is justified before God, by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. Paul makes this clear and direct statement. It's an unmistakable scriptural fact that no one can be declared righteous or justified in God's sight by obeying the law. The law with its standards and with its requirements cannot make a person righteous. We all fall short. 
So Paul, after making this very clear and direct statement, says, the righteous will live by faith. Paul quotes from the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous will live by faith. True righteousness and the way to live in a right relationship with God is through faith. Martin Luther, when he was a, a, a monk, it was this in Romans, where Paul also quotes this, that made him see the gospel for what it really was. And this is our only hope, too. We are only righteous through faith. This past week, I, I took my oldest son, Noah, to go on a hike. We went to Diamond Head. It was extremely beautiful, and it was extremely crowded. We got to the top, and we found that we had two choices. Two paths, two paths where we could go. We could either go to the left, or we could go to the right, because it's a loop. You probably know this. The sign in front of us said, we recommend that you go to the left. So that's what we did. That's what everyone was doing, and, and we did it too. Now, if we had gone to the right, we, we would have faced an almost impossible task of getting to the top and seeing all of the wonderful views because we would have been going against the flow of the people. Because there were so many people there, if we had gone to the right, we would have had to have stopped over and over again. We would have had to squeeze through crowded spaces. We would have had to wait and stand to the side as groups and groups of people walked by. Now, we would have made it to the top, but it would have been not nearly as enjoyable, and it would have taken much, much longer. Now, in this life, you're also standing next to the mountain. And, and you're also faced with two choices. There are two paths. There are two ways to go. The law is one way. But it doesn't work for anyone. We've been affected by sin. We really have actually sinned. It's not going to work. You're not going to just have a difficult time going that way. You're going to have an impossible time going that way. Because you have actually sinned, and you're not going to be able to squeeze through. You're never going to reach God that way. But the gospel, the gospel is the other way. The gospel is the other way. And that trail, it's clear. There's no one blocking you. The path is clear because of the work of Christ. So run. Run up the path. Run to Jesus. Trust in his finished work on your behalf. He did it all for you. The path is clear. Friends, salvation is not a reward for the righteous, but a gift for the guilty. And you stand guilty before God, but you can run to Jesus and he will have, his arms are wide open and, and he's ready and willing to forgive and to accept you as one of his own. By trusting in the finished work of Christ, you can be saved. So choose him. Choose his way. No other way is possible. Look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, the law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. In this verse, the Apostle Paul is highlighting the contrast between the law and faith. He says, the law is not based on faith. You see, the law and the faith, and faith, they operate on different principles. Observing the law, or even Hoping in your efforts or that you're a good person is different than having faith. This way, this path, this path of the law is all about principles. It's about requirements. It's about obedience. It's about what you do. And then Paul continues and says, on the contrary, the person who does these things will live by them. He's once again quoting from the Old Testament, Leviticus 18.5. What he's saying here by quoting this verse is that the person who seeks justification through the law to be made right with God through the law must perfectly keep all the commandments. This way is not about trust. It's not about faith. It's not about belief. It's all about work. It's all about effort. It's all about obedience. So as we have said already, if this is your path, you must do all the requirements of the law perfectly in order to really live, but you can't. It is an unattainable task. Look at verse 13. 
Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Here's the hope. Christ is the hope. You can trust in your efforts. You can trust in your good deeds. You can trust in your church attendance and your obedience to the Ten Commandments. You can try to blaze your own trail into the kingdom of God. But you're still under a curse. You're still separated from God. You're still dead in your sins. You will still face judgment and punishment, but Christ. Christ. What does Paul say? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed or saved his children from this curse. You have failed to perfectly obey the Mosaic law. Through the work of Christ, believers are delivered from that curse that comes with that failure. How? How did this happen? Paul says, by becoming a curse for us. Christ became a curse. He did it on our behalf. We should have been punished. We are the ones that failed to fulfill the law's demands. But Jesus became a curse in our place. Paul quotes from Deuteronomy 21, 23. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Jesus, by being crucified on the cross, by being crucified on that tree, became a curse as a part of his atoning work. He bore the curse so that you don't have to. If you trust in him for salvation and not for yourself and your efforts, you can be set free. No longer cursed. Our last verse, verse 14. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. What did Jesus do? He redeemed us. You take a, a coupon to the store and redeem it for a product. Jesus gave his life in order to redeem us, and now those who trust in him are his. Through his sacrificial death in our place, Jesus redeemed, Jesus saved all who believe from the curse of the law and the consequence of sin. Why? Paul tells us. In order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ. The avenue through which the blessings of Abraham come, the avenue through which the blessings of Abraham would reach the Gentiles is Jesus. Think back to last week. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. Jesus is the means or the way or the path by which salvation and all the blessings come to you. And he also did it so that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's presence in our lives. It is God living inside of us. The Holy Spirit comes to all who believe and empowers us to live a holy life. He gives us the gifts we need to serve God and to serve others. So that's our passage this morning. And again, what we see here is there's two paths, two ways to go. There's observing the law, and there's salvation by trusting in Jesus. One is described as a curse. One is described as a blessing. One path gets to God by trusting in his gospel of grace. The other is by keeping a righteous standard without error. Which path are you on? You need to know. Because it's only through the gospel of grace that you will no longer be cursed, but blessed. That's what the passage teaches us. If you don't want to be cursed, you want to be blessed, follow Jesus. Now, it's not lost on me that, that, that most of you are here. Every single Sunday at 10.30, you're here faithfully every single week, right? It's true. And thank you for that. It's a blessing to me that you're here. It makes me happy. <laughs> baseball player. He was also an evangelist. His ministry occurred during the first two decades of the 20th century. During one of his messages, he said this. This was his most famous quote. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going into a garage makes you an automobile. It's true, isn't it? I can stand all day long in a garage and tell everyone that I am a car. But am I a car? 
No, I'm not a car. I'm a crazy person standing in a garage. You might be here every single Sunday, and you might still not be a Christian. You might tithe. You might be kind to your neighbor. Maybe you give money to good causes. Maybe you treat people well. And that's good, right? Those things are good things. Those are things we should be doing. But those things don't save you. They don't. Those things won't get you into heaven. Your work, what you do, will not save you. But the finished work of Christ will. As the worship team comes, I want you to really consider this. During our response song, I want you to ask yourself, am I trusting in what I do to save me or what Christ has done to save me? Am I trusting in what I do to save me or what Christ has done to save me? Today, you can turn away from your efforts, which won't save, and you can turn to Jesus. He has done all of the work. The Christian life is a life of rest. It is a life where he carries the burdens of your life. It is a life where he has secured your place. It is a life of relying on him. It's more about what he has done than what you have done. So turn to him. Trust in him. Today you can repent of trying to save yourself and ask for forgiveness. Today you can trust in Jesus and his finished work on your behalf. Do not wait. Tomorrow is not promised. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may never come. Turn to Jesus. Trust in him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy and perfect word. We thank you that it shows us the path to you. It is not through our efforts. It is not through our obedience. It is through your Son. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Help us to believe that. Help us to turn from our efforts to try, of trying to save ourselves and to turn to you. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to believe. In your name we pray. Amen. If you have any questions about following Christ or about being a Christian, I invite you to speak to me afterwards. Or you can send me an email. Let's stand and sing together. Please join us. We sing. Amen.
Sunday, Reverend Chuck Lynn of Wycliffe Translators uh, will be preaching in our English and Mandarin services. Uh, it is our mission Sunday. There will be a craft fair, a luncheon, uh, so please be praying for this. Uh, the following week will be our Remembering the Saints Sunday. Uh, the sermon will be from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Uh, so if you would like to light a candle for someone, uh, please let the office know ahead of time. And then after that, we will be back in the book of Galatians. Uh, we'll pause at Christmas time and do some Christmas sermons, and then we'll finish up Galatians sometime next year. So uh, that's a preview of where we're headed. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Let's now bow for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated.
We are one.